This is Lee. He's a PhD candidate in computer science at the University of Toronto. He received his master's degree also in computer science in 2008 from Concordia University. He, his primary research interest is developing machine learning methods for analyzing high content screening data. Okay. Um, so, uh, today I'm going to get from you guys an overview of uh, the uh, state of progress on the project that I've been working on for um, it's just under a year now about uh, dimensionality reduction for high content screening data. So, um, this is sort of a typical high content screening um, experiment workflow. Uh, in fact, have you seen Brenda Andrews in the talk recently about, uh, something about the marker project, which is a um, uh, sort of a systematic uh, uh, experiment looking at uh, the effect of genetic deletions on different morphologies in yeast. You might have seen this very slide. Uh, and so what happens is you sort of you take your organism, you cross in some kind of query mutation uh, by sort of traditional genetic means, uh, then you, you can read this query strain into, uh, in this case, the yeast deletion collection, but it could be any kind of um, it could be any kind of uh, library. Um, you take uh, you take imaging in sort of your different channels, uh, capture them by a uh, high throughput um, microscope for fluorescent imaging. You then you extract your images, and you convert these images into some kind of numerical descriptors. So in this case, every row here is um, every row is a cell, and uh, it's described by things such as. Uh, Intensity of the nucleus, uh, shape of the shape of the cell, shape of the nucleus, um, various other features. And then the question is, so what do you do with it after this? So, two problems that uh, come up in high content screening for imaging is how do you identify which genetic perturbations tend to give rise to different uh, phenotypes and often you know looking for novel morphologies? And another one is how do you do this when these phenotypes are very rare? Uh, and when you're, you have very few examples of them, you have very little labeled data from which to build a model of what these look like, uh, especially in, in the space of your description. So um, on the left here, there's sort of an example of these, uh, which the original quality is better. But on the left is an example of uh, um, a drug step, a drug study in the mammalian cells looking at um, what types of drugs affect the morphology, the, the morphology uh, and of uh, I mean, these are human cells of some variety. And on the left are some of our own images of yeast cells bearing a couple of interesting phenotypes. So this cell here has sort of two, um, does it not come through very well? Yeah, so anyway, so these are so these two cells. Yeah, so this cell in particular here has two uh, DNA damaged foci in the nucleus, which is a really interesting phenotype. We'd love to be able to build a model to find all these types of cells uh, for their different populations. Um, and um, these nuclei here uh, sort of show a kind of a horn-like protrusion, which, is, which would be a really interesting phenotype if we could then identify it as well. But there's not really a great way to go doing this. Um, some, one way is to treat it as a supervised classification problem. So for each uh, phenotype, you, you gather a set of examples that of uh, cells bearing the phenotype, and then cells not bearing the phenotype, you treat it as a binary label, you build a classifier and then you evaluate uh, all the cells in your, in your collection on this uh, under this model. But the problem is that you have many, many, many cells on the order, of, so on one replicate you on, on the order of several million cells, at least for uh, our experiments in, in, the, in the yeast, uh, in human you might have more. Um, you have fewer, you generally have fewer features and many, many fewer phenotypes that you're looking at, but whatever can be revealed by the markers that you've chosen. So, you know, immediately you run into a problem where if you want to do this for multiple phenotypes, you have to redo um, classific you have to redo uh, your sort of model building and training and tuning process for every phenotype, and it's really laborious. So you'd like to avoid to do that. Right. So you, ideally, you'd like to sort of somehow take your big data matrix, um, and then you've got you know your data in these in this kind of big space, and you want to label sort of each column of data as either sort of red or blue, or or how many ever phenotypes you've got. 
one other so one other way to do this is to reduce the dimensionality of your data, and then you get some kind of say you get some kind of clustering model to it. So you're profiling the population rather than searching for specific phenotypes one after the other. And then you look at um, uh, populations that display sort of interesting profiles. So I'll tell you a little bit today about how to do this middle step. How did you reduce the dimensionality? So here's a couple of uh, existing methods applied to our varied data for three different phenotypes. So the red cells are uh, in these uh, map public plots are wild-type cells. The blue cells um, display a focused phenotype. The red cells display a non-red nucleus phenotype. And they're projected down to two dimensions by three common methods, PCA you probably all are familiar with. Uh, and then there's two others, isomap and local linear embedding. Uh, I won't go into the details. I don't really have time, but um, you can see that um, you get kind of a lot of plumping, uh, it, which is maybe natural in two dimensions, but and none of the three methods are terribly satisfactory. In particular, these last two methods, while have the, the more expressive power than PCA, uh, they're also much, much more expensive to compute. Uh, they're, both sort of, they're both on the order of n cubed, where n is the number of data points, so if you have a very large data set, they don't really uh, enter into the discussion. So here's a whole different class of, uh, uh, of, uh, of algorithms that uh, have come, come back into fashion in, in the late 2000s. Um, and around 2006, uh, there was a big, there's a famous paper in science where Jeff Hinton, uh, a neural networks guy at the University of Toronto, showed that you could use neural networks, uh, if you stack them in a certain fashion, to do dimensionality reduction. And so this, these models here, you know, the auto encoders are um, a group out of the uh, University of Montreal that's shown that they can be used to, this, to do the same thing. Basically what they do is you take your data, right, so this, this represents your data, each sort of circle is one dimension of, uh, of, your, of, your, uh, of each data point. Um, and in their construction, you apply some kind of noise function. Uh, so in this case, um, this accounts to adding speckling noise where you randomly zero out certain values. You, uh, you use some function to transform it into a lower dimensional space or compressed data. Uh, and then you also, you also have some kind of function to, um, to invert this function f, so you have reconstructed data, and then you train it by minimizing a loss function by, uh, which uh, accounts for this, the dissimilarity between your original data and your reconstructed data. Okay. So the way that you can use a, a denoising autoencoder to compress your data is you stack them up layer by layer, where the output of a current layer becomes the input of the next layer. Right? You successfully shrink uh, the dimensions so that um, you get to compose models to yield a very low dimensional input. So your first layer is going to be uh, dimension D, which is your actual data. The second layer will be a smaller, will be smaller. The third layer will be smaller, and so on, until you reach uh, whatever sort of dimension you want to choose to project your data down into. And so each of these little arrows represents um, an application of a function into some sort of subsequent lower dimensional space. Right? And the hope is then that you you uh, you learn um, you learn whatever functions that you know, you really sort of separate your data in the lower dimensional space and make it make the clustering algorithm in this lower dimensional space much easier. Okay, so this is just a quick slide saying that you know you start out here. This is one uh, you know as an autoencoder. You learn these W parameters, which parameterize the functions f and g. Then uh, after you learn this. You take your data, you push it through here, and then this becomes the input to the next layer, and you learn this, these parameters here, and then this the next layer, and then the subsequent, you, you, you know, however many layers you choose, here there's four depicted, you, you then get your final output data, which is a much lower dimension. Right, so the whole process kind of looks like this. So to test um, what this, uh, whether this model's in good or not, and compare it against uh, existing implementations of uh, the algorithms I showed you, uh, I came up with a, or rather I, I employed a test for um, uh, for clustering called homogeneity. Now homogeneity is just the proportion of elements in each cluster which are the members of a single class. So in this kind of toy example, you've got these two clusters. Um, each sort of has, uh, you know, four dots of one color, two of another, so they both have homogeneity two three. So you just average that and get kind of 
So what I did is I took labeled cell image data from um, that I used to to show the uh, two-dimensional problem earlier. Um, that has three classes representing different phenotypes, uh, and I applied repeated clustering. I reduced the data first with each method from the original space, which is about a thousand dimensions, they got a thousand um, different sort of image descriptors, down to 50 dimensions, 40 dimensions, 30, 20, and 10. And in each dimension, I repeated clustering with a three component Gaussian mixture model, uh, three because that was the number of labels that I knew that, that were present in the data set, and recorded the average homogeneity. So here's what I get. So each line represents uh, the one of the three methods. That I just spoke to you about before. The stars are um, one particular instance for some uh, for some um, architecture of a stochastic a stack denoising autoencoder. And so, for for 50 dimensional data, the SDAs tend to do pretty well. Um, certainly, the top five models uh, well beat uh, either uh, LLE or PCA or ISOMAP. Um, and as you start to get smaller, uh, the performance degrades and the variance goes up. Um, and why this happens, I'm not entirely sure yet, but one theory is that um, the models here, at least, they're all four layer models, and with these ones, um, the, uh, the, sort of the architecture and the layer sizes were chosen to optimize uh, reconstruction error where the, where the final dimension was 50 dimensional. So, uh, when I when I generated the data for 40 through 10 in the SDA model, um, I I basically just chose the, the same architectures except the top layer was swapped out for um, uh, some sort of like 40 for, for a, uh, a 40 dimensional or a 30 or 20 or 10 dimensional layer. So I didn't optimize the architectures for uh, for, for these subsequent models here. So the the performance could be improved. You know, don't. Don't worry that the, the stars are kind of getting um, uh, further apart, and that uh, after about three dimensions, uh, both PCA and LLE dominate uh, SDA. That this this could be improved. So. It's also important to note, though, that for uh, the size of data that we're working with, uh, neither ISOMAP nor LLE is actually um, a feasible uh, algorithm. Uh, so. I mean, we're, we're choosing between SDA and choosing between, uh, you know, something that can be applied to a large data set, I think it should be SDA and PCA. Okay, so to quickly wrap up, uh, <coughs> I hope that I convinced you that uh, SDA models uh, are tractable and they are very flexible for dimensionality reduction. And if you're in this area at all, uh, or if you have high dimensional data that you're looking to reduce and you don't, uh, you can't do something off the shelf for whatever reason, um, my software is available on GitHub. If you want to give it a shot, I'll be happy to walk you through it or, or hold your hand to uh, get it running. Um, and that's all, except that I'd like to acknowledge my, uh, my advisor, Shalva Jean, uh, my three members, Alan Moses and Quinn Morris, um, my, the PIs that we collaborate with on the Marker Project, Charlie Boone and Brandon Andrews, um, and most of all, the um, collaborator I worked most closely with, Karen Stiles, and previously uh, Karen Funk, uh, as well as uh, Jason Mock for use of the opera microscope. Um, it's sort of difficult because you you train that you, you train as you would train a neural network. So you're just you're um, you're doing a bunch of matrix uh, multiplications, um, and then you you compute some loss function and you back propagate uh, down through the network. And it's uh, I guess you you roughly sort of uh, you do as many epochs as you want. Let's see, you do as many epochs as you as you desire times the number of layers you have, matrix multiplications. Um, so, I mean, it, it's uh, it's probably it's super quadratic, but I don't know what the constant would be exactly. Um, it is, however, pretty fast because um, all of these models run on GPUs, 
So you, you get a pretty good acceleration over running on traditional CPUs. Uh, and also you can, you can train uh, all of your models in parallel, like all of the model search just happens, um, you know, uh, I run sort of 100 models uh, in parallel on Sinet. So it, it's, it's, it's really, really fast that you can, you can start from scratch and train, um, you know, 100 models and then pick the best 10 and have them ready to go in, in, in less than a day's computation. So you, it's certainly much more expensive than PCA. PCA is very, very fast because um, you're, you're working on sort of the kernel matrix of, or the ground matrix of feature type features. Whereas this is, uh, this, it's more involved, but you know, I don't think you're sacrificing that much more. And in, H, and in high confidence screening, I think usually you, you'd be willing to sacrifice a little bit of computational time to, to get a, you know, a little more precision. Yeah. I had a similar question, because you do back propagate or, or not? So. You, you told us that you pushed the data through the net, but it wasn't clear how the training actually works. But basically, you answered it already. You oh. do okay. error back propagate. <laughs> <laughs> question? Thank you.